So good morning, everyone, and welcome to this webinar, which is focused on the issue of underpayment of casual staff, which is, I think, appropriately being co-hosted by the Fair Work Ombudsman and TEXA. And of course, our audience this morning, it's a small select audience. The audience is of the peak bodies across the sector. And I thank each of you um, for joining us. Um, Sandra, um, Sandra Parker, who is the Fair Work uh, Ombudsman, uh, is co-hosting it uh, with me and she'll be uh, the first to speak um, fairly soon. Um, I would like to begin by acknowledging the traditional owners, recognising the important contribution that Indigenous people, Indigenous leaders play to, um, to the life and the work and the culture of our organisations and our institutions. Um, and recognise future leadership of Indigenous people as we recognise historical and contemporary leadership. Uh, for those of you who, uh, who are interested, and perhaps we all ought to be, could you please take note of, note of that information regarding the recording of the event? Um, I think uh, we all know why we're here today, and Sandra and I uh, neither of us, I think, need to introduce um, ourselves in links because you know our respective roles. Um, so I'm going to pass to her um, uh, immediately, but just say at the outset, we recognise what a challenging issue um, this has been for institutions and for the sector. Quite often uh, an issue which is viewed through the lens of complex enterprise bargain arrangements and interrelationships of different enterprise bargains, um, often, oftentimes look through the lens of clunky systems and so on. But I guess the issue has been around long enough now um, that we are, quite, we are quite concerned at the unevenness that has been demonstrated across the sector. Um, in, in the unevenness of response that has been demonstrated across the sector by institutions and by organisations. And really, this, this um, event today uh, is exhortative in nature. We, we want everyone to be on board. Um, we want everyone to be observing and respecting the best of practice. So with that introduction, I would like to ask Sandra to speak. After she's spoken, I will for a little while as well. And then we'd like to uh, allow plenty of opportunity in the remaining period. We've got 45 minutes altogether to enable any questions and comments um, that, that uh, that any of you and all of you may wish to make. So um, thank you very much, Sandra. Thank you, Peter, for your invitation to speak today. I'm here with Steve Ronson, the Executive Director of the Fair Work Ombudsman's Enforcement Branch. As Steve's co-leading the Fair Work Ombudsman's response to non-compliance in the university sector. So um, as per the introduction, I'm here to talk to you today about an issue that shouldn't have occurred, and that is instances of large scale systemic underpayment of employee wages, particularly the wages of casual academics and casual professional staff, totaling in the millions so far. Uh, since writing to all chancellors and vice chancellors in late 2020 of my general concerns, Regarding increasing evidence of wide scale underpayments across the university sector, uh, we've met twice in the past 12 months with the sector's peak bodies and with the Commonwealth Department of Education to discuss the issues and obviously uh, with TEXA. For those who are not personally familiar with the Fair Work Ombudsman, the agency was established with the package of the Fair Work Act in 2009 uh, to provide advice and education to employers and employees about their rights and obligations to promote and monitor compliance and to investigate breaches of the Fair Work Act and take appropriate enforcement action when required. With limited resources and a large national jurisdiction, the Fair Work Ombudsman has traditionally focused its compliance and enforcement activities on industries where we know there is poor workplace compliance and cohorts of vulnerable workers. And we use research analysis and intelligence to help us target parts of the economy or industries where we know there's likely to be poor compliance. So industries that have certain characteristics, such as low barriers to entry or a high number of small businesses operating, tend to have higher levels of non-compliance. Most of our requests for assistance come from industries like hospitality, 
horticulture and contract cleaning. The mm. workforce is likely to be young from a non-English speaking background or have other characteristics that can make them vulnerable to exploitation. So the industrial instruments that cover these workers and industries are generally awards and the entitlements are the minimums set out by the national system. These employers rely on our advice and educational resources to understand their obligations. Often they don't have sophisticated payroll, HR or in-house expertise. It's therefore appropriate that we provide them with as much assistance as possible. In the last few years though, we've been drawn more and more into corporate regulation through a concerning increase in the number of large corporate entities, including universities, self-reporting significant underpayments or in some cases being outed via the media. Given the extent and size of underpayments, we investigate each of these and we're currently investigating 14 universities. This presents a challenge for us as a regulator and it's put a strain on our resources that would otherwise be used to help vulnerable workers and small business operators. Just to put those our recovery figures in perspective, we recovered $30.6 million for workers in 2016-17. In the 2021 financial year, we recovered $148.3 million. The bulk of the rectifications of underpayments for the last two financial years have come via self-reported underpayments from large corporate sector entities recovered through enforceable undertakings with the Fair Work Ombudsman. Underpayments reported by these entities range from hundreds of thousands to above $300 million in one case. And you'd know as well as anyone the dim view that's taken towards such matters in the media and the community. Businesses have a responsibility to the community to pay their staff their correct entitlements. And when they get it wrong, they need to come forward and self-disclose these errors to the regulator in an open and transparent way. Our published compliance and enforcement policy makes our expectations of entities that uncover non-compliance with the workplace laws very clear. The public expects the regulator to ensure itself that corporates are calculating underpayments correctly and getting them back into the hands of the workers who are owed them as quickly as possible. And I've stated publicly that the FWO will investigate every self-report by a corporate entity as well as those that we learn about via the media, via whistleblowers or through referrals from other regulators. And I make no apology that we expect Australian universities to invest in governance frameworks and practices that will ensure compliance with workplace laws. Those that find non-compliance must meet the cost of remediating underpayment, pay interest on back pay and superannuation. These universities must assure the FOIA they've correctly identified and calculated underpayments and rectified all monies as quickly as possible. And we also expect these universities to have contemporary payroll timekeeping, record keeping systems, and to implement appropriate governance mechanisms around processes, systems, training for payroll staff, and regular audits commissioned by the university executive. The government's recognised the importance of this issue to the community and provided my agency with dedicated funding to establish a large corporates branch to focus on large corporate underpayments. It's another clear signal from the government that what is occurring is unacceptable and it must be a priority for the Fair Work Ombudsman. When I wrote to the Chancellors and Vice Chancellors last year, I set out the issues the regulator was identifying with university compliance with workplace relations laws. Though those issues included likely breaches of enterprise agreements arising from poor governance and management oversight practices, no centralised human resources function operating across faculties and schools, lack of investment in payroll, time recording and record keeping systems, control over HR and pay related issues mainly dealt with by academic managers of faculties and schools with little input from the central administrative area and a custom and practice of applying piece rate style performance benchmarks such as those contained in policies, guidelines or local operating rules relating to marking, lecture attendance and student consultation which are most likely in breach of the relevant enterprise agreements 
and have not had any worker input or consultation. So my letter urged universities to undertake audits to assure themselves they're compliant. I asked they report any significant underpayments or concerns to us. I note that other issues have arisen since I sent that letter, including potential reclassification, misclassification of some university staff, so they can be paid lower amounts. They're potentially very serious matters that we intend to investigate. So I'm grateful to those chancellors and vice chancellors who've responded to my letter and outlined steps they are taking to assure themselves of their compliance. And I'd like to thank the universities that have self-reported non-compliance and who are working cooperatively and transparently with us to correctly identify the underpayments and make restitution, along with ensuring it doesn't happen again. And obviously we expect universities to be transparent about how they're quantifying the underpayments, to share their payroll and record keeping data and methodologies. We need to assure ourselves they're being done correctly. And we wanna know how poor record keeping and employment data is being addressed and the assumptions made in calculation models. We will need to validate the approach taken in matters uh, reported to us. We know these things are a significant and resource intensive process. Senior leaders who are prepared to invest in undertaking these reviews uh, will be treated favourably by my agency. However, we will take a firm approach with those who do not cooperate with us. We're investigating in technology, in data analytics, to assess compliance issues on a large scale, we're using external experts. If entities aren't fully cooperative or they don't provide us with sufficient assurance that the remediation is accurate, we can and will undertake independent validation or recalculations. Now, obviously that duplicates work, it's expensive. It adds yet more cost to taxpayers. They're typically large scale investigations, they're complex and they are expensive for respondents. So in addition to assurance that non-compliance has been fully rectified, we will want to understand how the issues occurred, what's being done to correct them and what systems are in place to prevent them occurring again. We often hear from employers that the underpayments are a small percentage of total payroll. Our response is that the amounts owed to workers are not small to them and they are very quick to point out to us that their executives never seem to be underpaid. I acknowledge workplace laws are complex, particularly if an organisation is navigating multiple awards, enterprise agreements and classifications. But the fact of the matter is that whether large underpayments are due to mistakes, complexity or oversights, they are avoidable and they can be fixed uh, fairly quickly when compliance with workplace law is prioritised and where it's supported by the right systems and where there is a healthy and effective corporate governance culture. Now, as the regulator, we expect that organisations, large and small, equip themselves with the tools and information they need to understand and comply with workplace laws. This issue is now well known and understood by the Australian public. Not only will organisations face significant financial costs for non-compliance, but the damage to the institutional brand and reputation can extend far beyond these. So I hope that as leaders in the tertiary sector, you will direct your efforts to ensuring that universities are making serious efforts to address the issues we're seeing so they can meet their lawful obligations on workplace compliance. Thanks, Peter. Back to you. Thanks very much, Sandra. Uh, perhaps before I say anything, just to say the focus of the efforts uh, of Fair Work Ombudsman and TEXA to date have focused on the universities. Um, of course, uh, in, our, in our discussion this morning, we've also got representatives in addition to UAM, the IAU within it, we've got representatives of ITECA, uh, TDA, uh, are here in English Australia. So uh, the obligations and interests span everyone, but the universities have been the first cab off the rank and a significant cab off the rank because uh, of the of um, uh, of the number of uh, of the number of staff involved and in the predominance, I guess, of the university component of the higher education sector. In terms of looking at this, I might come to my first slide, if that's okay, please. Um, why is this matter of concern to TEXA? I think that falls into place fairly, fairly easily from what Sandra has said. TEXA, TEXA basically has two roles. One is to protect the quality and integrity of our system, and the second is to protect the interests of students, and if you like, in a consumer sense. So that, that, that's decoded um, what the 
uh, what the interest of Texas is in this set of issues, reflected in more specific terms through around the quality of teaching, uh, risks to the sector's reputation as an employer, um, breaches of threshold standards, um, and and so on. And moving fairly quickly on from that, um, the importance of it more specifically in terms of the standards is in respect of the requirements of the legislation, uh, which covers us all. Um, and of course, uh, the uh, obligations for institutions to be well led, well governed, well managed. Uh, and for institutions to, of course, uh, always report in, um, any any uh, material changes which might affect or impede their obligation to their, their ability to equip their responsibilities. Um, going to the next slide, ensuring quality and academic integrity, once again, is a, the, the theme is a pretty direct, uh, direct one in terms of linking from what Sandra said. Um, it, where, where a lot of this issue um, um, hits the road, the road hits the road is around um, teaching staff, um, their accessibility to students, um, the needs of students, how institutions deal with that in a proper way. And I'll say something about that and responding to that in a moment, as well as in, in as well as anticipating foreseeable risks. Our, our expectations, which is the subject of my last slide, and then I'm going to just say and make some general remarks about what good practice and and less, uh, what good practice and, and poor practice might typically look like. But in terms of our expectations, firstly, um, we do expect all providers, universities and other, to have a full understanding of their obligations and to take those seriously. Um, that will include, um, of course, undertaking reviews of payroll and record keeping and so on, um, and have clear steps to, to manage and mitigate their risks to monitor um, to monitor the progress that they're making um, and to cooperate with Fair Work Ombudsman in terms of its own work. Um, if I look at the uh, issue, I guess, through the prism or the lens of the Vice Chancellor or the principal of, 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 a, of a, a provider more generally, um, I guess what what typically might look like good practice Firstly, self-reporting issues out front, up front, um, and self-reporting issues in full, and self-reporting um, has a timely dimension, of, obviously, to it. What does that therefore then mean? It, it means that uh, the VC or the principal isn't just um, confining knowledge of, of an issue when it uh, arises um, with the senior management team, but 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 these issues go to the proper governance of institutions. And if audit and risk committees and governing bodies aren't aware of these issues, then I, then I don't think, and I think we all agree, that institutions aren't taking them as seriously um, as they should. And by governing bodies being involved, we, we always know the arguments about leadership and management, who does what. But governing bodies need to be briefed. Um, the actions that are going to be are, are going to be taken by institutions need to be understood and of course governing bodies should over, oversight follow up of course management is trusted to get on with things but but the governance function has has the oversight obligation as well um, if you look at a couple of steps below that what might um, good practice look like inside an institution it it probably looks like uh, and i'd like to acknowledge uh, they're not embarrassed some of those institutions that are doing this really well and Sandra's acknowledged that um, we we really do acknowledge the great progress that, that some places have made but and and typical and typical places that have made that progress are the adoption of a clear protocol and process around casual academic staff engagement um, also um, clarity around the support provided to students including outside tutorial consultation hours. Um, the, adequate, the adequacy of time uh, for grading assessment um, and the undertaking of payroll audits and the other measures that Sandra has measured, I think, uh, has, has mentioned. I think we all recognise um, the very, very serious financial challenges which providers are facing. Um, but, the, but the task of management is a complex one between balancing those, those obligations uh, um, to, um, to governing bodies for 
financial management uh, with the obligations we have to our own staff that they're treated properly um, in terms of their salary and benefits and the obligations we have to our students as well. Um, all practice is probably best exemplified by the response that there is no problem here and we've got it under control. There might be one or two instances that we, we don't have an issue. Um, that, that, is not, that is not really helpful. Uh, it doesn't demonstrate that there are robust systems in place. Um, on top of that, I guess that um, when issues are then raised for institutions to then say, look, we're lily white, and, and sometimes go to the press and, and in a heroic way and make claims about the actions that they uh, uh, have taken five minutes before the regulator arrives, none of that is really very helpful or very good. Um, we actually want institutions um, organically to recognise and to embrace the responsibilities that they have, and want to be and want to be best of breed in this in this sector of behaviour. Um, so it's it's not helpful if if institutions go through the motions um, of um, of review of of wage compliance, particularly if they do so in a very narrow way. Uh, and the last point I'd just like to make is it's one that Sandra mentioned as well, and it's really in the quite tricky territory. It's um, it's around um, the retitling of jobs, reducing of wages, um, what what employees might see as a fairly naked down, downgrading of job classifications, but no downgrading or reduction in the obligations attached to their duties. Now, we all want to we all want to work in places that are well functioning and that are efficient. And of course, vice chancellors and principals have always have an obligation to make sure they're getting the best they can out of the system, and um, and that the whole uh, the whole uh, reform agenda uh, is seized and always is engaged with. But there is an interesting and complex and fine line between that sort of legitimate management activity and um, some of the some of the um, some of the some of the measures uh, that seem to have been taken um, uh, in relation to staff. And we're not and we're not talking about staff at the top, of course, in this discussion. We're we're talking about staff who typically are um, very modestly paid and whose circumstances are the most vulnerable of any employees in the place. So I acknowledge that that's really tricky turf, that last one, and probably does, does, does deserve in its own right some engagement in this discussion as well as thereafter. But the motive of Sandra and I and our organisations in having this webinar is not to, is not to threaten, but to, in the strongest terms, exhort people um, and institutions to be behaving professionally as best as they possibly can with the interests of their students and their staff in mind. And if those matters are in mind, then their reputations will probably be intact. So I think that's all I wish to say in my remarks. Um, and I think Sandra and I um, are happy to, um, not happy, we're, we're, we're welcoming of um, conversations and questions. And I think um, I think she's already mentioned that um, uh, Stephen might be there to provide some support for on the technical side, on the fair work side. And uh, let's see how we go. Can we just open it up? Thank you very much. Uh, thank you, Sandra and Peter. My name is Penel Stern and I'm the Director of Risk and Compliance and I'll be um, moderating the questions in this session. The first question is for Sandra. Uh, Sandra, you mentioned that the Fair Work Ombudsman act on referrals from other agencies, and this would obviously include TEXA. How many referrals has TEXA provided to the Fair Work Ombudsman on this matter? Um, so thanks very much for that question. I think um, the answer to this is we share information and we do talk to other regulators. There have been a couple of referrals from TEXA that I'm aware of, uh, but the main thing is that we keep talking, keep discussing what we're doing, uh, and we and obviously when TEXA has intelligence or information, 
that we're not aware of, they, they will pass that on to us and same for us, we'll pass that on to TEXA. So it's an ongoing discussion really. Steve, did you have anything to add to that? Yeah, just uh, we've been meeting uh, monthly now for over a year and uh, it's been extremely effective, very helpful. And I think the longer we're going on, the, the better it's getting. But that information exchange, uh, the ability to validate different assertions and stories with each other is super helpful. So I think you're right, Sandra, there's been some formal referrals, but by and large, I think the value of our partnership and relationship is that we can share our respective lens of the sector and, and compare and contrast uh, responses. Thanks for that. Um, sometimes, let, uh, I just want to make clear that sometimes the information that comes in is through a material change notification. It's a very proactive response about what uh, providers have identified and the steps that they're mitigating. And that information really helps inform us and the Fair Work Ombudsman um, about the steps that are being taken and might address allay any concerns that we have. So we'd encourage you to continue to encourage your members to, to um, provide those material change notifications. So the, the next question is um, either for Peter or for um, Sandra, but maybe we'll start with Sandra again. What can we do as, member as a member organisation to support our members in upholding good practice within this space? Mm, thank you for that question. I think um, bodies, uh, peak bodies have a, a critical role in getting people together to talk about the issues, sharing the issues, sharing the pain to some extent in terms of the discussion. I mean, Peter's mentioned so this is not an issue that uh, we know this is an issue that nobody wants. Uh, nobody wants to find underpayment of workers. It's a very unpleasant and we understand that and we also understand universities are going through tough times at the moment. Um, what I would encourage peak bodies member organisations to do is to be open about these issues to discuss with each other and with members what they can do, what they need to do and how they can go about it. So you will already probably have examples within your organisation, within your members of people who are well ahead on this matter, who've already been doing audits, who've started to work through the issues. Um, they can share on how they're managing that, uh, what they're doing in terms of working with us. Um, but also I'd encourage you to come and continue to talk to us. I know that many of you have spoken to us, but keep talking to us. I said before that where universities and um, other organisations approach us in good faith, seek our guidance, uh, follow our advice, uh, we will uh, take a benign approach. And that's our intention. Uh, we'll work positively and it doesn't always have to end badly in the public domain. Um, there are many corporates that have um, confessed, if you like, stood up, acknowledged what's happened, worked through, uh, done everything we've asked, done the audits, shared their methodology of those audits, just been completely transparent, spoken to their workers, uh, committed to, to um, fixing their systems, offering us an enforceable undertaking, which sounds uh, unpleasant, but what it is is agreement that they'll do certain things and they'll report to us over the next few years to get assurance that's something that they can have some real confidence in of saying we're doing all the right things and we care about our staff and the public is um, far less, uh, let's say, rabid than they have been in the past on this issue. And I think that's, that's obviously because of COVID to some extent and they're well aware of what people are going through. Um, but also uh, in the early days when we had matters like the George Calambaris matter that was very, very ugly and played out very nationally, uh, it resulted in all those restaurants in Melbourne closing, 600 people lost their jobs when they identified underpayments of workers. I think that they, they, a lesson was learned from that, that it doesn't actually help anybody for employers to be treated as though they have committed a crime. Uh, it's actually about fixing the issue as quickly as possible addressing it into the future and moving on. And that's what we are there to do. That's what we're there to assist with. Um, 
Thanks, Sandra. Uh, uh, well, I think I would just add um, the, the theme of Sandra's comment or response was sharing experience, and I absolutely um, support that view. That's um, that's probably going to be the best. Uh, the experience can be shared in different ways. Um, obviously, it can be shared collegially and by by um, groups within big associations and more broadly. Um, we see some of the sharing uh, of an involuntary nature when state orders general um, get interested, uh, and uh, and I actually feel an underlying sense of optimism that that people are are wanting to get on top of this issue. Uh, if you, uh, my predecessor wrote in about September, Nick Saunders wrote in about September last year um, to the sector from a Texas perspective talking about the issue. And I think our disappointment was that while the, there were some that came forward, there were a small number of providers, and universities in particular, who were really taking the matter seriously and putting it together uh, and putting together uh, impressive protocols. Uh, a lot of people just were hoping um, the issue uh, was not going to blow up. And, uh, and therefore, the sector would be in the sort of risky place that the restaurant sector um, has been. So I think the answer is all about sharing experience. And I also um, don't think that either Sandra or, I or our officers um, think that that will always have it right. I mean, if there's if there's a need to engage with this um, so that responses um, can be calibrated, particularly what's doable, what's practical in certain timeframes, Sandra's already made clear. Um, that Fair Work Ombudsman um, is um, is very open to that, and uh, and of course Texas would take the same view. Thank you, Peter. Um, I was just about to add to that from from our perspective in Texas. If there's anything that you feel that Texas can do to support your members in the sector, please let us know. So the next question is for Sandra. Uh, for those of us who have smaller organisations. Any common pitfalls the Fair Work Ombudsman has identified that smaller providers need to be mindful of? Um, Penelope, I missed the bit of your question. Yes. I, something was happening with the technology. Sorry. For those of us who have smaller organisations as members, are there any common pitfalls Fair Work Ombudsman has identified that smaller providers need to be mindful of? Yes, thank you. Oh, look, I would say the same the same thing. The, the issues are appear to be systemic, the ones that I listed before, uh, and we're not seeing much difference across the universities, regardless regardless of size. The difference with the size issue is that you've got you know many in the larger university you have more faculties and and unfortunately a practice of doing things on a local faculty basis when it comes to paying people and working out what they should be paid. And so it can create obviously a broader risk, uh, but the smaller universities have the same risks and I would encourage them to review uh, what's happening in their organisation and to do audits. Um, our policy, I would encourage you to read it. It's actually quite easy to read. It's on our website. It's our compliance and enforcement policy and it sets out step by step the approach we will take and the approach we expect people to take. It does say that if you identify small underpayments, we don't need to know. You just need to fix them and address the issue. We want to hear where there's significant underpayments. Now, you might say to me, what's significant? And I think that comes to a, it is a case by case assessment based on your own analysis of that. The risk to you as an organisation, the risk to your reputation, the number of people that are affected, the size, the scale, how long it's been going on, all of those are things that will determine whether it is a significant issue or not. But if you're in doubt, by all means, let us know and we will talk to you about that and determine. But if you have a very easy, quick process for sorting something out, uh, then our view will be to let you get on with it. Uh, if, if it's larger, obviously we, wanna, we want more information from you. Sorry, thank you, Sandra. Peter, the next question is for you. Um, is Texa concerned that, uh, sorry, if Texa is concerned that this is a sector-wide issue, will it be seeking further information as part of the risk assessment process? Um, I, I assume we keep that 
uh, as a matter on watch. Uh, I would acknowledge that we're actually looking ourselves at, uh, my hesitation is that we're looking ourselves at, at our risk assessment approach. Um, so I, I don't think I would go beyond, uh, beyond that. Uh, to date, we uh, have sought to look at these matters, but um, let's face it, that only a certain amount of material comes, comes up for any institution uh, in a sector-wide sweep. Um, so if in doubt, I think institutions should um, err on the side of telling us what needs to be um, uh, told. Uh, and of course, uh, the Fair Work Ombudsman as well. So um, I don't think I'd add to that. I don't know whether you would like to add to it, Penel, and feel free if you would. Uh, yes, thank you, Peter. Uh, I was just about to just build on what uh, what you had said, is that um, we are um, reviewing the way um, that we assess, that we do our risk assessments uh, based on feedback from the sector and just an acknowledgement that we need to be able to access and use more real-time information. Uh, and we will be consulting with the sector on our new risk assessment framework in the early new year. Uh, I, thank you. Sorry, Penel, I was just going to add, just in terms of uh, the general question of risk, it's probably worthwhile just um, reinforcing uh, the, the obvious proposition that uh, it's healthy for uh, management to ensure that their re respective audit, audit and risk committees are aware of what is their risk profile, um, not just obviously to their finances, but as Sandra's remarked, um, their, the reputation. And if I could just offer uh, two potential key risks to keep an eye on, whether you're small or large. One is the absolute critical importance of timekeeping. We've seen it's those not just about having a, an effective payroll practice, it's about recording time. So there needs to be uh, some level of assurance that there's either sufficient timekeeping systems or begin to invest in those. And the second one, the second key risk that has emerged in our investigations is uh, if directions are being given to staff, particularly casual academic staff, those directions need to be very clear. They need to be uh, at least have had some level of consultation, but clarity, visibility. The academic staff have to know what are the rules, the policies and procedures that, are, that they are governed by. And if they're not, then it's pretty hard for them to work out whether those particular policies are lawful, particularly if enterprise agreements say, for example, we pay by the hour, but then that's not the practice. So I think they're key live questions that our respective audit and risk committees would want to make sure that they've got buttoned down. And audit and risk committees, of course, don't, don't at the senior level, don't report to management, they report to the governing body. At least I hope they all do. Thank you very much. I think that's the end of our questions. All right, so um, I'm, in closing, I'd just like to thank everyone um, for, um, for being on the line this morning. I think I, I, think I was given a final slide um, about next steps, <clears throat> but, um, and that might go up, but if it, if it doesn't, um, I guess the message we're wanting to convey is uh, the regulators are working together. Um, we actually are supportive in, of institutions and understanding of institutions and their circumstances, institutions that wish to uh, have particular circumstances that, that, that need to be understood. We, we, do, uh, we do, in the strongest terms, urge everyone to ensure that um, they, are, they are taking the matter seriously and that the matters have been shared um, and and dealt with accordingly by the government side of the institution and not simply by um, by uh, the management one. Um, and of course, the very last point there is that as regulators, our, responsible, our responsibility is that we act consistently and reasonably and that we'll seek to coordinate our efforts uh, between ourselves. Um, Sandra, do you have any comments you'd like to make in closing? No, that's excellent. Thank you, Peter. And again, encouraging people to uh, to come forward if they need our help. Thank you.
Thanks very much, everyone, for being uh, here this morning, and thanks to colleagues uh, in Texture and Fair Work for uh, doing all the hard work getting it here. Thank you very much.